Today, we're gonna to talk about why variables aren't real. Welcome back, everybody. Today, I wanna to talk about a lesson that is critical. It might be the most crucial lesson that I could teach any beginning C and C++ programmer, or really anyone who wants to understand how computer software works, under the hood, that is. And that is that your variables aren't real. They're not, or I mean, I guess you could say software, nothing in software is real, but the point is, is variables probably aren't, if you're a beginner, they're probably not what you imagine them to be. And so today, I want to help you see this in action and hopefully, better understand what variables are and how they work and maybe help you avoid some annoying, tricky debugging situations. We're definitely going to be looking at source code in this video, but before we dive into the code, I just want to say a huge thank you to all of you who support the channel on Patreon. Thank you for your support. Thanks for making this channel possible. I couldn't do what I do without your help. But so now let's take a look at some code. So today we're going to start with this really simple program. It's just an empty main and a couple of includes. I also have a make file over here that's going to compile my code. Really nothing crazy here, just the sort of thing that you've seen in just about all my videos. If you've never seen make files before, do check out my videos on make. And today I'm gonna to be working in C, but I could do this demonstration in C++ just as well and it would be exactly the same. But so since we're talking about variables today, let's start out by declaring some. Let's say that I come in here and I say I want an int and I wanna call it A and let's set it equal to some arbitrary integer or something like 5,000. And we can also create another int called B and we'll set this to 23. It doesn't really matter. Just pulling these numbers out of the air. Also, just for kicks and demonstration purposes, let's also make an array. We'll just give it one element, although, you know, it's again, this would work with bigger or smaller arrays, but we're just one element and we're going to, let's just initialize that value to one. And let's make one more called D, also one element, and we'll set its value to two. Now you might be wondering why I used one element arrays. That seems kind of silly. Why didn't I just make ints? And I do have a good reason for using arrays. And that is that this variables not being real thing tends to get real for programmers when they're using arrays. And of course I could demonstrate this on larger arrays, but look, size doesn't really matter here. And a single element array just means less typing. So we can see these values, just make sure that everything's working the way we expect. Let's also add just a little print statement in here. And I'm gonna say A equals percent D, I'll just print out B as well. So each of these, I'm just printing out these, these numerical integer values. C, we'll say C square bracket zero, it's just to say, you know, it is the, the element of C, not C itself. And that's also gonna be a percent D and we'll do the same thing with D. And then we'll come in here and do A, B, C, C square bracket zero and D square bracket zero. Okay, and I'm doing this just so you can see there's nothing funny going on here. I can come down here and I can compile my code and I can run it. And you can see, sure enough, we get the values that we put into these variables. So that's simple. Now, as a new programmer, you may have a picture in your head that I've just created these four buckets, right? These four buckets called A, B, C, and D. And now I'm gonna just, I can dump data into them. I can say, store this value in this bucket and so forth. And maybe these variables feel very real. They're my very real creations. But like so many things with computing, that's not actually what's going on here. What's really going on, well, rather than thinking of your variables as buckets, I think it's a little healthier to think of memory as a big block of data, ones and zeros all in a line. Or maybe you could think of it as it's like a blackboard, okay? like just this big clean slate. And when I say to the compiler that I want an int called A, it simply designates a location on this blackboard and that's where it will put A. So if I say store something to variable A, it's just going to store something to that designated space in memory on this big board. Okay, so let's make this concrete and let's actually see this in action. So to do that, I'm gonna print out a few more things. Let's print out some addresses. So let's print out the address of A. I'm gonna use percent %p here. That specifies that we're printing out a pointer, which pointers store addresses or locations in memory. And we'll print out the address of A. And we'll do the same thing here for B. And I would like to do the same things for C and D, only for C and D because they are arrays. We don't need the address of operator. And that's because arrays are almost the same thing as a pointer. I do have another video on that. So if you're a little confused about the sameness between pointers and arrays thing in C, do check out that video. It might make things a little less confusing. But so now if I take this, I compile it, compile it, and I run it. Now you can see that I've got a bunch of locations, addresses in memory where it has put my variables. 
And you notice that these variables, well, these numbers might be, they might look a little funny. Check out, I do have a video on hexadecimal if you're new to that. If you haven't seen hex before, this is just a different way of writing numbers. One that I don't have time to go into today, but I do have another video on it, so check that out. And it's also really important to keep in mind that the compiler we use determines how these things get laid out, right? So these addresses are largely determined by the compiler. You notice in this case, I'm using GCC and GCC is putting A first, then B, then C, then D, sort of in the order in which I declared them, that's fine. Let's say we come to our make file and we come in here and say, let's, let's say instead that we're gonna use Clang. If I come down here, if I come down, yeah, so uh, let's make clean and compile it again. And now if we run it again, now interestingly, you see that the order is reversed. Okay, so now D is actually, that's, that's coming at the first address in memory, C, B, and then A, okay? So for today, we'll stick with the Clang approach, but the point is, is that different versions of the compiler might, this example, you might get different results, and that's perfectly fine. Just adapt it to the addresses that you see here. But okay, great. So at this point, my variables aren't buckets, but why is this Blackboard model more helpful? Why does it matter that I understand that they're just part of one big contiguous block of bits? And the reason is, is that it can help you make sense of some really tricky bugs. So to see this, let's come back to our code and let's just change things up a little bit. Okay, so let's say that I want my program to be able to change an element of this D array based on some argument. So what we'll do is we'll just come in here and we're going to make a variable called index and we're gonna set it, we wanna get argv1, we wanna get an argument and it needs to be an integer, so let's pass it to ATOI. I'm not gonna do any error checking in this case, but in a real program you'd want to, but really I'm just trying to demonstrate this as quickly as I can. So here we're gonna get an integer from our first argument and then what we're gonna do is something like this. We can say d square bracket index, so we're gonna take the index element of D and we'll set that to some arbitrary number like 42. And now if I, let's save it, and if I come down here and compile it, and if we run it, well, it's seg faults now because I didn't specify an argument. So, but if I come in here and say zero, saying I want the zeroth element of D, that's the only element that actually is in D, then you can see that I've changed it to 42. Okay, that's simple enough, right? But what happens if I come in here and I say I wanna change element one, right? Well, now we've changed the value of C. And of course we can keep doing this. If we keep going, we can change the value of B. We can say three and we can change the value of A. And then of course, if I keep going, who knows what I'm changing after this? You know, I'm just clobbering memory, whatever came before A. And this is probably the most common way that we see one variable interacting with another, or when we see you know, our the idea of these buckets that we've created, we see them overflowing and impacting each other. And the result of course, is that we end up changing some variable like variable A without ever explicitly writing in our program that we want to change variable A because the variables are all laid out together in one big chunk. And what really happened is I just wrote too far at the end of variable D and I clobbered its neighbors. Now, just to try to hammer this home, let's do it one other way that is much less common in real programs, but I think it may make it a little clearer what's actually happening. Or maybe I just like to play with pointers. But you see, when you index an array, there's a really what's happening is we're doing some arithmetic with addresses. So let's let's look how we could do this with something that's not an array. So instead, let's say that I come in here and I just take the, I could take the address of B, for example. Now the address of B, this is an integer pointer. This is gonna give me a pointer to an int which happens to point to this location that's holding B. Okay, so we'll come in here and then we're just gonna add one to it. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna increase that pointer by the size of an int, by a size of a single int. So that's gonna be adding four bytes to it. And then let's just take this whole thing. So this is going to be an int pointer that points to the integer location right next to B. And then if I come down here and I just put an asterisk, I'm gonna dereference this. So what I'm saying is that integer that this thing points to, I want to assign it to the value of 80. Now this is mimicking what actually happens when I say D square bracket index, except that D is already a pointer, so I don't need to get its address. But now if we come down and we compile one more time, we can see if we run it, let's go back to zero. You can see that my code here, my code that is basically trying to access the thing right after B, ended up clobbering the value stored in A or in location A. And so this is one of the reasons why you always hear me and others talk about the importance of bounds checking in your arrays. This can lead to a lot of security issues where you can change one value through another variable. 
This also leads to a whole lot of really messy bugs. And this is something that a lot of other programming languages with safer type systems protect us from. Go, Ruby, Java, Python, and a whole lot of other languages. But so next time you come across a really nasty bug where a variable that shouldn't be changing is suddenly changing to a new value, then just click your heels together a couple of times and repeat to yourself, variables aren't real, variables aren't real. They're just locations in a big contiguous block of data, ones and zeros, and maybe something else is clobbering this variable. And then maybe bust out something like a watch point in your debugger and that can help you track down what's actually clobbering it. So I hope that helps. I hope it helps clear some things up, some nasty bugs. I hope it helps you be more confident, capable programmers. And until next week, I'll see you later.